lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. I'm really excited about today's show. I'm going to explore ornamental grasses and provide tips on how to incorporate them into your landscape. Ornamental grasses are one of my favorite subjects. They add so many elements to a garden, including fantastic movement, feathery height, naturalistic and romantic qualities. They possess a billowing and cooling and softening aesthetic, tactile beauty, hazy form, seasonal interest, and structure. Grasses offer such a diversity of textures, colors, and forms, there surely is a grass for every garden. Today, I'll be walking you through a number of wonderful genera of grasses and hopefully entice you to incorporate grasses into your landscape. So that's what today's show is all about, ornamental grasses, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. But first, of course, I'd like to start out by saying thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week. I'm so honored that you're spending time here listening to the show. In fact, I hope you're listening to a bunch of gardening podcasts because it's such a great way to grow and learn as a gardener. I know my favorite place to listen to gardening podcasts is when I'm out in the garden working. And then, of course, I spend so much time in the car driving the kids around that I invariably end up listening to gardening podcasts while I'm in the car. But it really is one of the best ways I know to continue to grow and learn as a gardener. I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for this show. It's a free private Facebook group that I host for listeners of the show, and these folks are made up of gardeners of all skill levels and locations. And you can find it on Facebook just by typing in the name of our group into the search bar. So you just have to go to the search bar and type in Still Growing Podcast Group. And the listener community will show up at the very top of the search results in Facebook, and then just click to join and we'll admit you into the group. Now, there are a number of benefits you enjoy by joining the group. First, you'll have access to great garden articles that I curate for you, and they will appear in your Facebook newsfeed. In fact, you know, one way that you can make what you see on Facebook more customized to your interests is to join groups on Facebook that focus on topics you're interested in. So if you want to see more helpful posts about gardening, then by all means, join a gardening group like the listener community for the show. Second, this Facebook group, the listener community, the still growing podcast group is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any of the show giveaways. So if you hear something and you think, oh man, I'd, I'd really like to win that, you've got to be in the group group first. Finally, you get a chance to interact with the great guests that have been on the show. And that's really what I had in mind when I created the group, that if you listen to a guest and you wanted a chance to maybe ask them a question or follow up with them, you'll have the ability to do that in the Facebook group. The majority of guests that have been on the show are in the group, all of them are invited to join, and the majority of them actually follow through and join the group. They love talking to listeners about the subject that they're passionate about. Now, the content that I share within the listener community is something I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. So everything that I post in the group or that I see others posting is put together with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Speaking of joining, let me take a moment and welcome new members who have joined the Still Growing Podcast group over the last couple of months. Katrina Lucier, Brandy Vaklovic, Amber Gooden, Niobe Odysseus, Carrie Neff Embry, 
Isabella Borges, Restu Mayuni Reinhardt, Amy Morris Dennison, Evan James, Jenny Hartware, Tracy Shirley, Sarah Ladd, Jenny Fourlines, and Ruth Jackson Noble. Welcome, you guys. Well, there were a lot of great posts from listeners this week. They shared beautiful pictures and videos of their gardens. Danny Perkins took a number of different videos of his garden, specifically including his gorgeous limelight hydrangea that are totally in full bloom, echinacea, an update on his squash. And of course, we got to see his beautiful dog, Miss Dolly, joining him on his garden walk. And listeners love Danny's garden. It is absolutely gorgeous. One of the images that he shared in the past couple of weeks is his ham and eggs lantana that's blooming by his roses. They're completely intermingled. And he wrote that with all of them clustered together like that, it looks like an old-fashioned corsage. Absolutely glorious. Lori Eisenstadt shared some beautiful blooming cactus photos out of her garden in Phoenix, Arizona. Julie Mahoney in Bolingbrook, Illinois, shared her tree planting and blueberry planting. All good stuff. Listener Craig Thompson out of the United Kingdom shared this fabulous post. I want to read it to you. He showed an image of a garden bench, and the back of this wooden bench says Mr. and Mrs., and then his name and his wife's name, and then the date of their wedding. And it's just a very captivating photo. And here's what he wrote. This is our memory garden, not memorial, so not exactly. This bench was the guest book at our wedding and has lots of lovely messages written all over it. There's a planter given to us by my best friend, a hydrangea that surrounded us as we were married, and a pot of phylum, Spotty Dottie, given to us as an engagement present by my gardening aunt. These will soon be joined by an Astrantia Florence, also given to us by my lovely gardening aunt, to celebrate our new daughter. Don't wait to lose someone before commemorating them in a memorial garden. Celebrate them while they're around to see it, and think of good times when having a cup of tea in your memory garden surrounded by loved ones. Well, this post got an enormously positive response from other listeners. People loved this bench idea. You have to see it. It looks like it was laser cut. Craig said that the bench was his wife's brilliant idea. She thought a message book would get stored and never seen. So this bench was the solution to that concern. And it's just a very wonderful way to commemorate their wedding. It's an absolutely fabulous piece. Jennifer Konow shared pictures of her Culver's Root now in its second season. She says Culver's root always seems to be crawling with pollinators. So if you're looking for a new specimen to add to your pollinator garden, try Culver's root. The other thing that Jennifer shared that I thought was very novel is that she puts different fruits out on a fruit tray feeder for butterflies. She typically puts out bananas and gets red spotted purple butterflies. But she said this week her son couldn't finish his watermelon, and so she put that on a tray, and she was rewarded with her very first question mark butterfly. And then she wrote, I think it got quite tipsy on the strongly fermented watermelon. Anyway, great pictures here and great ideas as well. Darlene Urso shared a video of her astilbe. They are absolutely glorious. I would say they're at their zenith for their bloom. They look absolutely amazing. Sarah Ladd had shared she had read the book by Holly Farrell, Plants from Pits. And the subtitle is How to Grow a Garden from Kitchen Scraps. And Sarah is experimenting. She's growing an indoor papaya plant from pits. Now, as that little seedling is coming up through the dirt, it's a little yellow, and so we're trying to help her troubleshoot why that is. And when I was researching the papaya, 
I found out they have really big roots and they can get very tall, like seven to 15 feet tall. So definitely not a small specimen. So if you're going to attempt to grow a papaya, make sure you have a large container for it. Esther DeWaters shared a really fun picture of a gray ladybug, which was a great reminder that ladybugs don't always have to be orange and black. In fact, they come in a variety of colors, including yellow and pink. Listener Edgeworth Carter shared a great picture of a mantis chilling among his tomato plants. It was really cool. Sue Lufdag shared pictures of her dog, Jerry, standing by her cat mint, and her question was, should I cut the cat mint? Her neighbor said she should, but the bees seemed to love it, and listeners overwhelmingly responded, leave the cat mint for the bees, myself included. I never trim my cat mint until it's done blooming with that first flush of blooms, and even then, I'll just cut it back about a third and try to stimulate a second flush of blooms. And then not to be outdone by the ever photogenic Jerry the German Shepherd, Laura Gonzalez shared her puppies and they were laying underneath what she called an asparagus dog fort. Unintentional, of course, but she's got these beautiful stalks of asparagus. And of course, the dogs have found a way to nestle themselves among the stalks of asparagus, and they've got a great little cool, shady spot to watch her as she gardens. And then speaking of dogs, I was driving John to Creighton Durham Hall for basketball this week, and I happened to take a side road to get to the school that's over in St. Paul, and it took me through this charming little neighborhood just north of the school. And as I drove by, I was totally struck by this amazing sculpture that was in the front yard of this home, surrounded by gardens, of course, but the sculpture is what really caught my attention. And what it was was a picture of a puppy, and he was perched on top of a tree stump, and it made me think that there was great potential that this puppy statue had been carved out of a tree that they'd had to cut down. So I picked John up, and after I'd picked him up, I said, John, you've got to see this statue. And so we drove by again, super slow. I took a video for the Still Growing Podcast group because I wanted to share it with the listeners. And then, as luck would have it, a neighbor had just pulled up on onto the street. And as she was getting out of her car, I said, tell me about this statue. Is that actually carved out of the tree? And she said, yep, about a year ago, the tree was dead and they had to cut it down. And so they hired a chainsaw artist to come and and carve this magnificent statue of a puppy on top of this tree stump. And it's so charming. So this week, right before I picked John up for the very last day of camp on Friday, June 30th, to celebrate the 4th of July, they had put a red, white, and blue Hawaiian lei over the dog's neck. And it's just so cute. But I'm sure they do a lot of wonderful seasonal things to decorate that dog as the year progresses. It was charming. And then equally sweet, Melissa Van Zeeland, another listener, shared that she was having a hard time convincing Mama Snipe that I won't touch her eggs. Fortunately, I won't need to water for days due to all the rain we've had. But she showed this adorable little snipe nest that had two eggs in it, and it was, of course, right by the drip line for her garden. It's very nice of her to shut that drip line off. I know I've done the same thing when I've had either nests of bunnies or bird nests in the area where I've got drip line. You know, last week, I just got back from the Garden Bloggers Fling in Washington, D.C., and fellow garden blogger Janet Zargan Ledeber shared this fantastic idea that she ran into when she was touring a 
garden on Sunday. Now, I missed the gardens on Sunday because I was traveling back home. That was my travel day. But she showed this fantastic picture that someone had created a, a faux fire pit in their garden. So what they had done is they have two lawn chairs, and then in the middle of the lawn chairs is this adorable little fire pit. And instead of fire, they have plants that are growing to make it look like it's fire. And so what they used is bolting lettuce, looks like some crotons. I suggested using Swiss chard, zinnias, begonias. I think the list goes on and on if you wanted to do a similar thing. So if you're not interested in having an actual fire pit and you want to create a little round bed that can double as a faux fire pit, this was a very clever idea. There were a number of requests for plant IDs this week. Amber Gooden took a picture of this beautiful, floxy-looking plant and said, can anyone tell me what this is? We have them growing in a clump behind our house. And the verdict? Dame's Rocket. Now, some people don't like this plant because it can be invasive. On the other hand, it's easy to pull. And some people love it because of the purple blooms. And it also has an amazing fragrance. So that's another plus to letting it hang around. Ashley Holloway shared a great article about the beauty berry. Turns out beauty berries are edible and they're also a fantastic insect repellent. Spencer Hoadley wasn't sure if the berries in his backyard were blueberries or blackberries. And the verdict was blackberries. And then Laura Gonzalez shared a gorgeous photo of her artichokes in a vase and then showed what happens to artichokes when they bloom. They end up with this magnificent purple bloom on top of the artichoke. They're absolutely stunning this way. Now, in Laura's instance, she'd gone on vacation, and while she was on vacation, the artichokes bolted. They went to flower, and so she smartly decided to make a gorgeous arrangement out of her artichokes. Then listener Patricia Chandler Newport chimed in, and she said, I'm always torn because I love to eat the artichokes, but I also love the flowers. And then Laura replied that she discovered that the flowers are quite fragrant, and she'd never noticed that before. And then fellow garden blogger Julie Thompson Adolf chimed in and said, the bees love the flower. So it's another great pollinator plant. Katrina Lucier shared that it was wonderful for her to have a garden again. She shared pictures of her Johnny Jump Up, her strawberries, potatoes, and raspberries, and her Islander bell pepper was beginning to turn purple. And she got a great photo of that pepper in the middle of its transition from green to purple. Absolutely magnificent. Melissa Van Zeeland needed help identifying a perennial that was in her Wisconsin garden, and the common name for it is sundrops. They're also called evening primrose, and they are a very vivid yellow. Now, one year, I actually took these out of my garden because the yellow in the sundrops is so magnificent that sometimes it can clash with other yellows that are in your garden. So don't be afraid to do that. If you have a flower that's just not working for you, you can always take it out and give it to a friend. There's nothing wrong with that. In listener love this week, listeners shared their appreciation for the group. Sue Lufdig said, thanks for the tip on spraying my antique peonies with milk and water. So far, working great. It's making a huge difference on the powdery mildew. And then Ashley Holloway shared, I absolutely love seeing photos of everybody's gardens popping up on my Facebook feed. And you know, that got me thinking of a new app that I discovered this past week that's been so helpful for me since I belong to so many gardening groups. Anyway, it's simply called Facebook Groups. So if you go to the App Store, just search for Facebook Groups and then download the app. Enter your username and it will pull the groups that you belong to and show you the information that's 
popping up in those groups. So you can just focus on that information alone. This is not going to show you information that your friends and family members are showing you. That can be on the regular Facebook feed. But if you just want to narrow your focus and only look at the information that's appearing in the groups that you're part of, this Facebook groups app is very helpful. In fact, I think when I use it to manage my groups, it's actually faster than going through regular Facebook. I find it to be very reliable and very easy to use. And personally, I love using this app to stay on top of what's happening in my groups and also to see new comments when they pop up in the group. That way I don't miss them in my Facebook feed, which sometimes can happen because there can be so many things going on in your Facebook feed that a comment or two can get lost. But this does not happen when you're looking at the comments that are brought up in Facebook groups. Anyway, go ahead and give that a try. I think you just might enjoy using that app in conjunction with joining the listener community for the show. In fact, I just love our little community. I love the fact that we all share this passion for gardening and a curiosity to learn more. So if you haven't already, come hang out with us. Don't be shy. I'd love for you to join for free the next time you're on Facebook. Just type Still Growing Podcast Group into the search bar and then request to join. I look forward to meeting you over in the group. Now, if you have any questions or comments for me, you can always go ahead and contact the number for the show. It's 865-333-GROW or 865 333 Four seven six nine. Go ahead and add it to your contacts in your phone address book. And then if you have a gardening question or a suggestion or comment for the show when you're out and about in your garden, you can go ahead and let me know. Just go ahead and give me a call. I'd love to hear your voices. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I have shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with. And that's something that I call the Dream Guest segment. I also cover news and information information on special topic areas like sustainability and science. And then the other segments are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the how-to DIY segment, the continuing ed segment, the plant spotlight, shopping, recipes, inspiration, and quotables. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay pretty informed of the latest news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. In the guest update segment this week, a number of guests shared some really great posts about what they're up to. Megan Kane shared a great post she had written called Five Reasons You Should Prune Your Tomato Plants. Now, let me give you one just as a teaser. The first one she mentions is that you can harvest your tomatoes sooner. And here's what she wrote. Right after planting our tomatoes, we want to put as much energy as possible into growing bigger and better. A healthy-sized tomato plant will yield more fruit than a stunted one. 
But there comes a time when the scale tips, and as the tomato plant grows, it keeps producing more and more suckers, stems, and leaves. Each of these new suckers is forming into a whole new tomato plant attached to the main stem. That means the plant needs to pump a lot of energy into these new parts to help them grow, and that takes energy away from fruit production. When you keep the new growth to a minimum, you encourage the plant to focus on what you really want it to do, produce delicious fruit. Pruning can often lead to earlier harvests of your favorite garden vegetable, fruit, tomato. And then Megan goes on to offer four additional reasons. Vegetable literacy author Deborah Madison from episode 533 shared a blog post on her blog called Cooking with Confidence, where she said, I recently did an online interview with Lisa King, who has a blog called Cook with Confidence. It was great fun to do, and if you're at all unsure of yourself in the kitchen, I hope you'll take a look. Anyway, I did just that. I signed up for Lisa's site to get her newsletter. Her website's called cookingwithconfidence.me, and I love it. She's sharing tips, tricks, and secrets from expert chefs, food bloggers, cooking teachers, and more to help you find inspiration, passion, and success in the kitchen. And so, of course, she talked to Deborah Madison, and that, of course, was reason enough for me to sign up. Guest Shelley Cram of episode 548, she's the author of The Gardener's Bible, shared a new plant called Olive Martini from the Southern Living Plants Collection that she was very pleased with. And then Lori Neverman of episode 541, and of course a blogger over at Common Sense Homesteading, shared a new blog post called Queen Anne's Lace, Butterfly Host Plant and blueberry protector. Now, one of the more memorable things that Lori points out with regard to Queen Anne's Lace is that she received an interesting comment when discussing weeds on LinkedIn from an organic blueberry grower who uses Queen Anne's Lace to attract beneficial insects. Here's what he said. As I wrote to you, we have planted Queen Anne's Lace among our certified organic blueberries. They attract a parasitic wasp that attacks the Drosophila fly that is spreading throughout the Pacific Northwest, attacking blueberries, cherries, blackberries, and other soft-skinned fruit. We do not have to spray the Drosophila because of the wasps solving the problem for us. How fantastic is that? In Sustainability This Week, author Kylie Baumley shared a post called A Milkweed Bouquet. Kylie's an expert when it comes to monarchs. And in the post, she outlines the steps that she takes to help monarchs thrive on her Ohio property. Also in Sustainability This Week, Thomas Christopher shared a fun post on Garden Rant, and it was simply called Wildlife Encounters. And my favorite line from this post is, A quick look at my Peterson Field Guide to Animal Tracks revealed that we had acquired a garden moose. And then I came up with the hashtags Garden Moose, and then of course, Moose on the Loose. But what I loved about this is that Thomas had seen tracks in his garden and then was determined to figure out what those tracks were made by. And of course, it turns out to be a moose. It's a fun little article. I really liked it. Listener Sue Lufdig had shared a question in our Facebook group, basically about how to handle the squash bore. And so in continuing ed this week, I shared a post called How to Defeat the Squash Vine Boar. This was a very excellent post by Nature Moms. And here's what she recommended. You need to start with some prevention in the early spring. Most of us buy starts or transplant starts that we grow indoors. You can wrap the stems of your squash seedlings with medical gauze. It is flexible enough to grow with plants, but prevents caterpillars from eating into the stems. Spray your plants with Bt. It's a beneficial bacteria that controls the larva stage. 
You may want to cover your squash plants right up until they flower with a row cover, a cage, or some kind of gauzy netting that will not give moths access to the plant. So overall, this was an excellent article on defeating the squash vine boar by Nature Moms. In the how-to DIY segment were a number of posts. The first was Six Secrets to Growing Better Bush Beans. This was by Off the Grid News. There was a fantastic DIY project that was posted in Smart Schoolhouse, and it was instructions for how to make a seashell planter. There was a great video tutorial on how to make hypertufa spheres. You can basically make these with cheap beach balls that you buy at Walmart. You cover them with drywall tape and then cover with quick wall. And then there's a video to walk you through that. And my favorite part about it is that you can moss them up. So they end up with that attractive moss covering over the hypertufa. And then Gardenista shared probably one of the most comprehensive posts I've seen on how to make Kokodama string balls for a hanging garden. That was fantastic. Boy, there were so many plants that made it into the plant spotlight this week. That spotlight is shining pretty brightly. First up was a fantastic post by Garden in a City. This is a blog that's done by a husband-wife team out of Chicago. And they had shared a post that was called Culver's Root, Something Newer is Better. And there's a fascination version of Culver's Root that is a gorgeous purple. And the post about this new Culver's Root is called Sometimes Newer is Better. Anyway, now that I'm reading more of this blog, they had also shared in late June a great post about Juneberries. And they wrote, we think of fall as the season of fruitfulness, but there are a number of plants bearing ripe fruits in June. And of course, that includes Juneberries. It was a very nice article about Juneberries. Guest of the show, Gail Eichelberger, shared a post on her blog, Clay and Limestone, back in the beginning of July that was called Gloriosa Daisies for National Pollinator Week. And the picture of her Irish eyes and Indian summer black-eyed Susans were absolutely striking. The emerald green central cone on Irish eyes is just something else. So that definitely made it in the plant spotlight this week. Greenhousegrower.com shared a post with Kelly Norris's recommendations on new plants. And the one that caught my eye is this checkmark wajilia from Spring Meadow Nursery. It has red, pink, and white blossoms. An absolutely beautiful combination for wajilia lovers. And then Get Busy Gardening shared an article that was called How to Care for a Potted Plumeria Plant. And this was a fantastic coincidence because listener Michael Lockstamfor had just shared a picture of his plumerias. He wrote, another happy accident. I had no idea how easy it is to propagate plumeria in these parts. He lives down in Florida. And now I have 25 plus baby plants. I don't think I'm legally allowed to sell them. So if anyone is nearby and would like one or three, you're welcome to them. Amy did a great job on this post, and it was perfect timing. I could share that with Michael. And then finally, the blog woodchuckacres.blogspot.com shared a beautiful picture of Indian hemp. And I say it's a nice Joe Pieweed alternative. In the news this week were a number of posts The Michigan State University Extension shared an article about how homeowners in Michigan are battling a weedy orchid that's invading lawns and flower beds. It's broad-leaved helleborine, and it's once again causing trouble for homeowners who are finding it in their lawns and in their flower beds. All right, in the dream guest segment this week is Nettie Edwards. Nettie was recently an artist in residence at Laycock Abbey. Laycock Abbey is this gorgeous setting for many different movies, including Downton Abbey and Harry Potter. It's absolutely exquisite. And Michelle over at Veg Plotting wrote this amazing profile of Nettie, and it was very captivating. 
Now, what Nettie was doing as the artist in residence is she was set up over at the Botanic Garden on this huge property over at Laycock, and she was creating her work with anthotypes. And if you're not familiar with what an anthotype is, you're not alone. I had to look it up as well. But an anthotype is one of the earliest methods of trying to replicate something and then creating an image. And you use the juices from plants and or flower juice. Now, of course, the first step that Nettie would have to take is to extract the juice from the flower, fruit, or vegetable. And this would be done using a pestle and a mortar. The next step is that the flower juice is mixed with either alcohol or water to make it thin out a little bit, and then it's brushed onto a paper. And then you have two options. You can either take the object that you're trying to use, whether it's a peony flower or some type of image from the garden, so you actually have the item and you lay it on top of the paper and you just set it down flat on a horizontal surface and wait for it to dry. And where the flower is sitting on top of that liquid will dry darker. And so you'll have the outline of the leaf or the flower or whatever it is you're trying to create with your anthotype. The other option is to sandwich the specimen between glass. And then you put it in the sunlight and the sun will work its magic to create the outline of the image that you're trying to create with your anthotype. So in a nutshell, these anthotypes are botanical photographic prints. And Nettie Edwards was there to do demonstrations for folks who were visiting the botanic garden. I thought her studio setup looked absolutely charming. And I've since started following her on Twitter. So you just have to go to Twitter and look up Nettie Edwards. And I think she's like the first or second option. But if you click on it and see someone who's working with anthotypes, you'll know that you've got the right person. Now, in the blog post, one of the most captivating images was a scan that was taken of Nettie's notebook, where she's taking samples of the dyes that different plants produce. There was the soft blue of Clematis arabella, the bright yellow of buttercup, the viking purple of Rosa the fairy, the hazy grayish purple of the allium, and in this post, it talks about how Nettie is currently experimenting with bull's blood beetroot and other allium. Now, the other wonderful resource that this blog post linked to is Nettie's blog. It's called Hortus Lucas, and I'll share this post in the Facebook group this week. But her post shares her introduction to the anthotype process and then shows her very first print. And I tell you what, for a first time, I thought it turned out very nicely. So you'll have to read the post, but she did a great job. It's a mesmerizing thing to walk through and watch her work on. I find the entire experience completely fascinating. And that's why Nettie Edwards was in the Dream Guest segment this week. In Science This Week was a handful of posts. The first was a post that showed that new research was exploring the potential of using steam or hot water for early weed control. Now, this research showed that creeping wood sorrel required exposure to 90 degrees Celsius for at least five minutes for 100% control, and bittercress was completely controlled within just a minute of using hot steam on it. And I thought this had tremendous potential for product development for someone who wants to create some type of steamer for weed control out in the garden. Because there are folks that are afraid of using flame weeders, but a steamer might be something that they'd be more open to using. So we could be seeing steamers on the market in the near future if someone wants to act on this research. Theconversation.com shared a wonderful article that was called Pavlov's Plants. New study shows plants can learn from experience. Now, this article was about Australian evolutionary ecologist Monica Gagliano. And Gagliano uses phrases such as plant cognitive ecology, 
and plant learning and communication. In fact, in 2013, she was featured in an article by Michael Pollan called The Intelligent Plant. And she's run a number of experiments on plant behavior, and here's what she says. Plants may lack brains and neural tissues, but they do possess a sophisticated calcium-based signaling network in their cells, similar to animals' memory processes. There's much more detail in this article about her experiments, but it ends with some tough questions. First, do plants like animals have consciousness? Second, if plants learn, choose, and associate, what does this mean for our ethical relationship with them? And then finally, can humans learn from the adaptive capacities of plants? Very fascinating. In shopping this week are some really fun items to consider. The first is the Just Add Cream New Strawberry. These strawberries were featured in The Guardian, and apparently what sets this new variety apart is its flavor. And not only that, it has an outstanding scent, and it produces for almost six months out of the year. So the Just Add Cream strawberry should be in everyone's garden. Gardenista wrote an article this week on rainwater collection urns, and they shared a variety that are sourced everywhere. And of course, they have a number of different prices from very affordable to outrageously expensive, but they're all featured in this wonderful post that I shared in the Facebook group this week. Then there was a very fun post that was shared by Inhabit, and they're featuring a giant nest that comes complete with two huge egg pillows, and you can curl up in it and fall asleep. So it's a piece of furniture that looks like a huge bird's nest, and it even comes with these two egg pillows. And then they show these kids and their dad all snuggled up in this egg pillow reading a book or playing on their iPhones, whatever it is they want to do. It looks so relaxing. And just really fun. And then finally in shopping, I had the pleasure of sitting in the back of this motor coach as we were touring gardens in D.C. for the Garden Bloggers Fling. And I was sitting by Karen Rexroad, just a wonderful lifelong gardener and plants woman. She owned her own nursery. And we somehow got on the topic of garden tools. And she shared with me that her favorite tool was this Barnell BLK727 stainless serrated harvest sickle. Well, I wasn't going to let this opportunity pass me by, so I whipped out my phone right away, and she helped me locate it online. And you're never going to believe this. It's a whopping $8.61. Now, you have to be careful because it's extremely sharp. But it can get the job done when you're out in the garden. And I had to chuckle because I saw a post from a listener in the Facebook group named Laura Gonzalez. And as she was showing her gorgeous lavender and harvesting her lavender, what did I see in her picture? A harvest sickle. So I don't know if it's the exact same one, but clearly folks love to use them in the garden. And this would be a great resource for you if you're looking for something new to try out there. I ordered one for myself and I'm looking forward to getting it later this week. An inspiration this week, Gardenista shared a post called 10 Classic Layouts for Townhouse Gardens. So this is a great inspirational post for people with small gardens who are looking for exceptional layouts to accommodate dining, lounging, and play. Lots of great ideas in this one. And then fellow garden blogger Dee Nash over at Red Dirt Ramblings shared an adorable post called Tour Gardens Are Pageant Girls. And here was the part of the article that I loved. She said, my husband will tell you that gardeners are the most competitive people he knows. Gardeners who love a particular plant are even more discerning. They will go to great lengths to get their gardens pageant, I mean tour, ready. And then I think anyone who's ever been on a garden tour can relate with this next part. I've seen gardeners install new landscapes, build new buildings, create ponds. Oh, wait, that's me. Or should I say Bill, my husband? He doesn't know it, but Bill would make the best pageant mom ever. He sees the overall woman, I mean garden, and he works on improving what Mother Nature gave her. You may not remember, but three weeks before the Oklahoma Horticultural Society 
to her, he built a pond with help from his friends. I could have killed him. Anyway, it's a super fun post for anyone who's ever stressed out to get their garden ready for a tour or a visit from friends and family. Totally relatable. And then finally, Beth Engel shared a link that could be inspiring to someone out there. She wrote, in case anyone out there is interested, here's some information on grants being awarded to therapeutic gardens. Please see the link for details. So, of course, I clicked on it. And this is a grant by the National Garden Bureau. Every year, they select three therapeutic gardens as recipients of a grant that will help build or perpetuate a therapeutic garden. Applicants must have the plot of land in their possession at the time of application with at least a five-year commitment for a garden to be on that property. All right, I have no recipes to share this week, but I do have quotes. And of course, given that the topic of our show today was about grasses, I was trying to find some quotes about grasses. And I tell you what, when you look at quotes and you're searching just exclusively for the term grass, not much comes up. And the things that do come up aren't exactly the kind of quotes that I'm looking for. So I started to think about grass and probably grass's best friend, and I think that's the wind. And so when I put those two terms together, the kind of quotes that I was looking for started popping up like crazy. So I thought I'd share some of them with you today. And of course, they'll feature not only grass, but wind. The first one is by Archibald MacLeish, and he wrote, There is no dusk to be. There is no dawn that was. Only there's now, and now, and the wind in the grass. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats wrote, I hear the wind a-blow, I hear the grass a-grow, and all that I know I know, but I will not speak. I will run away. Catherine Mansfield wrote, Wind moving through grass so that the grass quivers. This moves me with an emotion I don't even understand. And then here's one I love by Rumi. He wrote, The same wind that uproots trees makes the grass shine. The lordly wind loves the weakness and the lowness of grasses. Never brag of being strong. The axe doesn't worry how thick the branches are. It cuts them to pieces. But not the leaves. It leaves the leaves alone. And Rumi also wrote, O sweet wind passing over love's grass, blow in my direction, for the fragrance of love is my wish. And then finally, a saying by Confucius, When the wind blows, the grass Ends. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. Well, with that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, Ornamental Grasses. Ornamental grasses add so much to your landscape. They offer a diverse number of benefits to any garden, amazing structure throughout all four seasons, a romantic, hazy, relaxed quality to the garden. I call it their hazy, lazy, let's hang out here culture. The colors range from blues and purples to reds, greens, yellows, oranges, browns, and even blacks. Just imagine the following scenarios. Walking into your garden early in the morning and seeing dew on the seed heads of your grasses, or the majestic quality of the grasses in the fall when their colors are as vibrant as the leaves on the trees, or looking out your window in the wintertime to see the feathery plumes loaded with birds. Grasses are absolutely breathtaking. As far as I'm concerned, Grasses possess a magical quality, and perhaps this has something to do with their marvelous relationship with one of Earth's four basic elements, the wind. Wind is powerful, invisible, 
playful, soothing, and life-giving. It can also be incredibly destructive. There is this wonderful relationship that happens between grasses and the wind. Grasses make the wind visible by their movement, and the wind, in turn, enhances the beauty of the grass. The grasses' inflorescences play with the wind, and they also invite us to reach out and touch them. They are quite irresistible. How many of us haven't reached out to touch the grasses as we walk along a path? Even the sound of the wind through ornamental grasses is alluring. The rustling of the grasses adds yet another sensory experience for the gardener. Now, for this show on ornamental grasses, I'm going to share some thoughts on why you should consider adding grasses to your garden. I'll review some of the most loved cultivars from popular genera of grasses, and I'll share some thoughts on the care and maintenance of grasses, as well as help you with some tips on planting and division. So let's get to it. To get started, to set the table, I thought we'd go over some of the terminology that's used to talk about grasses so that you can understand the different characteristics that you need to pay attention to. The first is cool season versus warm season. Some grasses are cool season grasses and others are warm season grasses. Now, cool season grass starts to grow early in the spring. And these cool season grasses can remain pretty much evergreen over the winter. Now, as their name implies, these grasses typically do better when the temperatures are cool. So if you're having a coolish spring, never fear those cool season grasses are going to be able to handle that just fine. In fact, some cool season grasses even die back in the summer. So if you've ever had a lawn that's covered in annual bluegrass, you'll see it disappear in June because that's how it works. It starts to leave seeds to germinate during the next cool season. So with cool season grasses, you should be thinking about them looking their absolute best during the late spring and the early summer. So examples of cool season grasses include blue oat grass, fescues, autumn moor grass, carl forester, sedges, rushes, carexes, to name a few. Then we have warm season grasses. And these are grasses that tend to do better in the warmer times of the year. So be thinking about summer and especially into late summer, July, August, September, Even October, these warm season grasses can remain looking absolutely fabulous when the temperatures are hot outside and moisture is limited. Your warm season grasses are going to wake up kind of slow out there. They really wait to get going until the weather outside figures out that it's summer and things get hot out there. Now, warm season grasses can be a little slow to establish. That first year of life, they can really just focus on establishing their roots and not doing a ton above ground. And that process can even take an entire second year of life. So don't get frustrated with them. They're doing their job. They're trying to get going. And that's a very important thing for them to do. And keeping that in mind, it makes complete sense why these grasses are best planted in the early spring because they need that time to get established. And if you plant them in the late fall, they just don't have enough time or enough energy to get established in the ground before winter comes. So sometimes that can be a reason for why your warm season grasses failed you. Now, these warm season grasses turn tan in the fall, and then you can leave them up for winter interest. And when spring hits, you can cut them back. I usually cut them back to about three to six inches above ground, right as the green shoots are starting to appear from the crown of the plant. Now, some examples of warm season grasses include your miscanthus, your muhlenbergia, panicums, penicetans, hakoni cloas, pampas grasses, andropogons, etc. Now, something else you need to pay attention to is their growth habit. 
There are two options here. Grasses can either be clumping or running grasses. And of course, if they're running grasses, we're talking about rhizomes. So I always think of the running rhizomes. Those are the ones that are going to spread. The clumping grasses are going to stay in very nice, neat mounds or clumps. Just because they are clumping does not mean they're not going to increase in size because their actual girth will increase in size as they mature. However, if we're talking about those running rhizome grasses, they're going to spread by their underground stems and they can get to be very aggressive and even invasive. In fact, as we're talking today, as I'm walking you through the various grasses that are available to you, make sure to do some checking in your area to see if some of these grasses aren't considered invasive because they very well can be. This is why it's important to do your homework before you pick a grass. Be sure to understand what it's going to do in your garden, in your area. Now, just a quick list of some examples of grasses that can be very invasive would be blue lime grass, ribbon grass, of course, Japanese blood grass, to name another. Another aspect that you need to consider when you're looking at grasses is whether or not they're evergreen or deciduous. The evergreens, of course, will stay green year-round, as their name implies, and the deciduous are the warm-season grasses. They turn brown or tan when it freezes outside. So think about it this way. The evergreen are the cool-season grasses, and the deciduous are the warm season, meaning they're going to look like they're dying back. They're going to turn tan as things get cold out because they prefer to be warm and happy in the sun and in the heat of the summer. Another factor to consider is whether or not they're annual or perennial. For example, the Rubrin grass is an annual And if you're shying away from some of them because they're annuals, don't forget that they can make absolutely great houseplants. And of course, the benefit of bringing them inside is that they're only going to get bigger and happier in the house. And when you take them outside in the spring, you'll have an even larger, more beautiful specimen to take outside with you. Now, one other term that I wanted to make sure you were familiar with when we're talking about grasses is the term inflorescence. And inflorescence is just simply referring to the flowering portion of the plant or the grasses. So in this case, we're talking about the gorgeous seed heads that extend way beyond the ribbons of the grass, usually high above that. You'll see these gorgeous plumes, and that's referred to as the inflorescence. So if you start watching YouTube videos or you head over to your nursery center and you see a presentation and they're talking about the inflorescence of the grasses, that's what they're referring to, the flowering portion of the plant. All right, now there are a number of enticing advantages to having grasses in your garden. First of all, they're low maintenance. And I know as gardeners, we often kind of snicker to ourselves when we see those articles called no maintenance or low maintenance gardens, because of course, all gardens take a certain amount of work. But grasses really are one of the most hands-off plants that you can grow in your garden. You don't need to fertilize grasses, although I often, when I first plant my grasses, will incorporate a slow-release fertilizer just with that initial planting. Now, something to consider is that if you do fertilize your grasses on a regular basis, that extra nitrogen can make them floppy. So if you've got floppy grasses and you're fertilizing, stop doing that because you're just creating kind of that messy formation that so many of us don't want to see with our grasses. But in general, grasses are very hardy. You want to focus, especially with those warm season grasses that take a year or two to get established, you want to make sure that you're watering them well especially in the first year. In fact, drip irrigation is excellent for grasses. And since I have drip irrigation all over my property, they're deliriously happy here in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. 
Another advantage of grasses is that the deer don't eat them for the most part. I mean, they'd have to be really hungry, I suppose. There are probably examples of deer eating grass if things get really dire for them. But in general, grasses can withstand harsh weather. They can withstand disease and pests as well. And bonus, they can handle all types of soil, whether it's clay or sandy. The thing to remember is that they do need drainage. So oftentimes when I'm telling people to plant grasses, I'll encourage them to plant them and make a little mound for them. In fact, that's one of the little hacks you can use when you're planting grasses is to plant them partially above ground level with their crowns kind of sitting a little bit higher so that they have that nice drainage that they're looking for. Grasses provide great visual impact in the garden. In fact, how many plants can you say provide four season interest in the garden? Well, grasses do that. In the spring, they get growing right away. When you see them in bloom, their blooms are visible. You don't have to hunt for them. They're way above the foliage, the blades of the grass. And the fall experience with grasses is absolutely terrific. Now, from a size standpoint, large specimen grasses, and and some can get to be as high as 16 feet high, they can be a great alternative to trees. And here's the bonus with these grasses is that they grow fast. Ornamental grasses are not only low-maintenance, attractive additions to your landscape, they're also wonderful wildlife plants. They give the animals and the birds food and shelter, and they're ecologically a great choice just because overall they provide so much benefit for so little care. And one of their absolute best benefits is the fact that they help stabilize the soil. They help prevent erosion. Now, in my opinion, one of the saddest things to see is when a gardener cuts back their warm season grasses before winter. So those gorgeous grasses have worked all year to send up their beautiful inflorescence, their gorgeous flowering seed heads, and then the gardener will cut them back in an effort to minimize their spring cleanup. But it's really such a shame, primarily because the grasses give you this wonderful winter interest. And if you cut them back, you lose all of that. And not only that, if you cut back your grasses, you're eliminating that wonderful winter food source for birds. So if you're a gardener that actually goes out and buys bird seed, and at the same time is cutting back your garden, cutting back your ornamental grasses, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Now, later in the show, I'll share some tips on cutting back your grasses in the spring to make your cleanup process easier. And maybe that will help convince you to leave your ornamental grasses up throughout the winter. Two last benefits that I want to make sure that I touch on before I close out this part of the segment is that you can create drifts of plantings and that you can use the grasses to soften items in your landscape. So first in terms of using them as drifts of plantings, I've seen them used to line the edges of walkways. I was just in Barbara Katz's gorgeous garden in the D.C. area as part of the Garden Bloggers Fling, and that's what she had done. She had many grasses lining the paths, and it was just used to such wonderful effect. And of course, the other wonderful benefit of grasses is their softening effect. They can soften unattractive items in a landscape. They can soften some of the harder elements in a landscape. Grasses always look wonderful next to stone or solid wood pieces in the garden. A few episodes ago, we talked about incorporating large leafed plants into our garden to help make the garden look older and to help establish the garden. Well, Plants with huge leaves like Regersia or like Joe Pieweed often look wonderful paired with grasses. And finally, don't forget that grasses can be used as a wonderful ground cover. So the benefits of grasses are many. And now let's talk about 
some of the actual specimens that you might want to consider bringing into your landscape. First, let me just point out, I've had a few listeners share with me how much they love the blue-eyed grass that's growing on the North Dakota prairie right now, but that's actually not a grass. It's actually a small iris species that's blooming, and it is absolutely beautiful, but it's misnamed a little bit. It's not a grass. It's an iris. So let's begin by talking about the cool season grasses. These are the evergreen grasses. And the family I immediately think of are the Calamagrostis grasses. Now, Calamagrostis comes from the Greek kalamzos, which means reed, and agrostis, which means a kind of grass. So we're talking about reed grasses here, and that's a name that they're commonly referred to as. The genus Calamagrostis includes over 250 species, and they grow all over the world. And of course, we can't start talking about Calamagrostis without talking about the very popular Carl Forrester grass, the Calamagrostis acutiflora. Before I tell you about this particular grass, I thought it would be fun to share a little bit about Carl Forrester. He was born in 1874, and he died in 1970. He was a famous gardener of perennials. He was a botanical philosopher, and he lived north of Potsdam, Germany. In fact, you can go to his home in Bornum, and see his lovely garden. His original garden included six different types of gardens. He had a sunken garden, a spring path, a nature garden, an autumn bed, a rockery, and an experimental garden. And I know we all at least have one of those, especially if you factor in the experimental garden, right? Anyway, when I was looking up Carl's biography online, I stumbled on a wonderful post by a guy named Larry Reddig, who has been a gardener for over 50 years, and he published this wonderful article about Carl back in April of 2010. And this required a lot of work on Larry's part, because so much about Carl Forster has been written in German and has yet to be translated into English, so it's tough to come by information on Carl's background. Larry included some wonderful pictures. There's a picture of Carl standing next to these amazing delphinium, and the caption reads, Forrester, with his beloved delphiniums, note the stout stems that require no staking. And when you see this picture, you'll see these beautiful delphiniums. They look to be about five or six feet tall, and you would not believe the stalks in the middle of these delphiniums. I mean, they're incredible. He has pictures of Forrester as a young man with his sister, Hulda. And then lots of pictures of Forrester's garden and how it evolved over time. Now, Carl Forrester's name in German was actually spelled differently. It had that O umlaut, that O with those two little dots over the top. And so that's why we have Americanized it and we call it Forrester. But they actually would have referred to him as Herr Dr. Professor Forster. And then Larry noted that Germans do love their titles. Carl was born in Germany, and his father was no slouch. His father was Wilhelm Furster, and he was the renowned astronomer and director of the Royal Observatory in Berlin. And not to be outdone, his mother was the well-known painter Ina Furster. And if you think you've been gardening for a long time— Carl began a gardening apprenticeship when he was seven years old. And then when he had that completed, when he was a whopping eight years old, he went into the Gartner Lerenstalt Wild Park. So he went to the basically the garden learning school at the age of eight years old. And he stayed there for 11 years. So If we had had a chance to grow up and go to a professional gardening school for our entire education, I'm certain we all could be better gardeners today. But that's exactly what Carl Furster was able to experience as part of his upbringing. And it happened to be a perfect fit for him. He loved plants. His passion was perennials. 
And he particularly loved those that exhibited maximum beauty, resilience, and endurance. He would have made a wonderful Zone 4 gardener because we appreciate those things as well. So when he was 18 years old, he went back home to Berlin and he takes over his family's nursery operation, which he sees as a complete mess. It's a hot mess in his mind because it's very chaotic. There are too many plants. And he applied this principle of looking at plants for maximum beauty, resilience, and endurance criteria. And he did away with everything else. So he narrows down the selection and the nursery starts to take off. And then in 1910, seven years later, so he's now 24 years old, he moves his nursery to Potsdam where he spent the rest of his life. He gets married to a woman named Eva. She's a singer and a pianist, and they have one child, a daughter, Marianne, who was born in 1931. So as you're thinking about Carl and you're thinking about his standard for plants, that they have to be excellent in order for him to endorse them, in order for him to fall in love with them. And you can see why he has this incredible motto. His motto was, das Gute ist der Feind das Besseren, which means being merely good is the enemy of becoming better. So now we are starting to see that Carl is totally type A. He is a maximizer. He is an achiever. And he's constantly striving side by side with his plants to perform. So you can imagine the standards he had in place as he began his breeding program. As a breeder, one of the things that Carl was known for is the fact that it was important to him to allow nature to do its thing, to take its course. He never pollinated flowers by hand. He just simply put the two plants next to each other and allowed nature to take over. And of course, as Larry points out, from this breeding program came a number of clumping grasses, including Calamagrostis acutiflora, the plant we commonly refer to as Carl Forrester grass. And to this day, we still think of it as the old standby grass, the grass that never fails. And now you can see how that completely dovetails into Carl's philosophy of beauty and excellence and hardiness. So you have this passionate plantsman in Carl Forrester, and he's starting to work with clumping grasses, delphiniums, and ferns. And he starts to change the way people were gardening in Europe, especially in his home country of Germany. In fact, he influenced this new style of gardening called the New German Garden Style. And Carl not only has a grass named after him, he also has a delphinium and a white rose that's named after him as well. And there's another plant that you might have heard of. It's the Rutabecchia goldsturm. Now, this plant wasn't named after Carl Forrester, but Carl Forrester did name this plant, and it's still popular today. So we have this type A, overachieving, high standards plantsman in Carl Forrester. And can you imagine what it was like to go and hear him speak? Of course, he was lively, he was moving, he was excitable, he was passionate when he was speaking about gardening, and he wrote quite a number of books. So the English translations of these titles include From the Flower Garden of the Future, Blue Treasures in the Gardens, I'm sure he's referring to his delphinium here, a Vacation from Woe, I love that title, A Vacation from Woe, Spending Time in Your Garden, of course, and then Garden Beauty. Now, sadly, none of these works have been translated to English, but what amazing titles. I mean, doesn't that just excite your curiosity to know more and to read these works, even though they were written nearly a 100 years ago in some cases? Now, when Larry was writing this post, he included some little-known information about Carl and what his life was like during World War II. 
At great risk, Carl employed many of his Jewish friends in his nursery operation. And Larry said that he resisted the Nazi demand to propagate and sell only pure native German plants. After the war, the Soviets took control of Forrester's nursery, and although Carl was still working there, the nursery was now managed under tight Soviet rule. The only supplier of perennials for all of eastern Germany was Carl Forrester's nursery. Amazing. Because he was such a wonderful contributor to the world of horticulture and to literature, Forrester received many distinctions. He received an honorary doctorate at Humboldt University in Berlin, a professorship there, and an honorary membership in the West Berlin Academy of Arts in 1967. And Carl lived to the ripe old age of 96 So if you think about the fact that he started gardening in earnest when he was just seven years old, he spent nearly nine decades gardening. How fantastic is that? So after all of that, I'm sure you'll never look at Carl Forrester grass the same again. And yes, you can find them everywhere. But now when we understand a little bit more about Carl Forrester, you can see how this grass met his standards. It stays upright. It is low maintenance. And the blooms last all summer and into the fall. So even though it's a cool season grass, and most cool season grasses can peter out by June or July, Carl Forrester does not do that. Carl Forrester just is so wonderful that it starts in the spring and just continues to produce all summer long and into the very beginning of fall. Carl Forrester grass was the perennial plant of the year in 2001. And then there are a couple of other Calamagrostis that I'd like to share with you. The first is Calamagrostis overdam, which is just a variegated version of Carl Forrester grass. So you end up with this green and white foliage. It looks fabulous when you add it to white gardens. It's low maintenance and it's hardy to zone four. And then another Calamagrostis you should know about is the Brachytrica, which is also known as the Korean featherweed grass. This one is gorgeous in the autumn. I've seen pictures of this beautiful grass with ice crystals Encasing the seed head, it's absolutely beautiful in the winter. My friend blogger Beth Stettenfield loves to take pictures of her Korean feather grass in the fall. Now, the seeds can spread everywhere. So if you grow it, you might be pulling your brachytrica from your garden in places where you don't want it. But it is still one of my favorite ornamental grasses. It's about 36 inches tall when it's mature and it isn't quite as upright as the Carl Forrester. Now, another wonderful cool season grass is the Festuca glauca, the Elijah blue or the blue fescue, which is wonderful as a low border. With this grass, of course, you get this beautiful blue color all season long in the cool season in early spring through early summer. It's zones four through seven. Now, some people here in Minnesota, I know, can have a tough time getting that to overwinter, but I've had success with it in my microclimate backyard where there's a lot of stone and where the soil is very well drained. Festuca glauca is a great companion plant for olive trees. I know it loves a sunny spot. They use it at the Cheyenne Botanic Garden. I've seen gorgeous pictures of this blue fescue with white hydrangea. I mean, you put those two combinations together, there's blue and green tones in the white hydrangeas, and you put the fescue by it. It's just glorious if you're making any type of container. In fact, the Elijah blue looks great in a container all by itself. And if you have difficulty getting it to return, then use it as an annual in a container. It's striking. And I tell you what, if you're able to let that thing go to seed, you'll notice that the seed heads are very intricate. And we often don't pay attention to that because we're looking at that blue foliage. 
But check that out the next time you have blue fescue in your garden. A lot of times, if I'm putting together a bouquet, I'll take those seed heads from the blue fescue and I'll incorporate them in a cluster into my bouquet. I just love the seed heads of blue fescue. Another wonderful cool season grass that can be hard to get going but is very worth investing in is the Molinia Sky Racer. This one reminds me a little bit of asparagus when it blooms. It can get to be about four to five feet tall and it looks amazing at the back of a border. You end up with those amazing wispy plumes very high up from the blades of grass. In fact, the clumping form of this grass is only about a third of the plant. And then the rest of the two thirds are these tremendous plumes that soar up into the air. And then the tips are purple, but it looks absolutely amazing at the back of a garden. And in the fall, the leaves and the stalks turn in a gorgeous gold yellow. It's probably my favorite grass for early winter interest. And because it's so billowy, and so filmy up on top, it's a great see-through plant, just like asparagus. So if you're looking for a way to incorporate something that's statuesque and a little glamorous, Millennia Sky Racer would do the trick. Now, a few other grasses that fall into the cool season category, the evergreen category, are the steepa grasses, the Mexican feather grass, and the steepa tenuifolia also known as ponytail grass. Now, the genus name Stipa is derived from the Latin stipes, meaning tree trunk, and the Greek word stupian, meaning fiber. And this is in reference to the use of fibers of the species Stipa to make rope. And of course, the species name Gigantia is derived from the Latin, meaning very large. Now, the Stipa tenuifolia, or the ponytail grass, is native to Mexico. It's obviously very drought tolerant once it gets established. And the best part about it is how it dances when the wind blows, because at the slightest breeze, this ponytail grass that's so delicate is going to Create amazing movement in your garden. And I always chuckle because even if you don't feel artistically inclined, I like to say that anyone can draw ponytail grass because it's this amazing little clump of very small blades of grass. It's positively wispy. Now, the Stipa tenuifolia is zone six. And by the way, there are so many ways to pronounce stipa. Some people say stipa, some people say stipa, I say stipa. Cheers. There's one cool season grass that I know all of us are familiar with, and the species of the genus is digitaria, and that's crabgrass. So if you're trying to remember how to distinguish a cool season grass from a warm season grass, just think of crabgrass. It has all of those cool season evergreen characteristics of grasses like the Carl Forrester, like the Sky Racer and the Steepas and the feather grasses. And if it helps you keep them straight, then that's one thing we can be grateful for to the genus Digitaria. Let's move into the warm season grasses, and we'll start with the Andropogon genus. Andropogon is a combination of two Greek words, andros meaning man's and pogon meaning beard. So literally translated, it's man's beard, and this is probably because of the hairy appearance of the seed heads of these native grasses. Now, the andropogons are close cousins of the schizocheriums, which we'll talk about later. But the andropogons are wonderful for erosion control. They're great in mass plantings. They're great at the back of borders. You can use them as screening. You can use them in prairie plantings. In fact, these plants have North American roots. You've got the andropogons, 
the schizocuriums, the panicums, the sorgastrums, all of these were prairie grasses. So just think about the prairie as we're talking about these. And what do we know about the prairie? We remember that when the settlers came to the prairie and they're settling across the prairie, they talk about these grasses, like an endless sea of grasses, just waving in the wind. They were crossing this ocean of grasses. And what function did the grasses serve in the prairie? Well, of course, they kept the soil in place. They have extensive root systems. They provide food for livestock. They are helping out the butterflies and other pollinators. They help give coverage for wildlife, habitat for birds. And then all of that changes. And we take this prairie land and we turn it into farmland and cities and suburbs. And so when you think about what has changed ecologically just through the lens of looking at grasses, it's absolutely staggering. And so now here we are today, hundreds of years later, and we're talking about these prairie grasses in terms of the modern landscape. And so when you're thinking about how to care for these plants, don't forget that they're prairie plants, and prairie plants were not getting fertilizer. There was no one walking through the prairie fertilizing all of those grasses. In fact, once again, if you start to fertilize these prairie grasses, you're going to see them grow super fast. And because they have this accelerated growth, they can't stand up straight. They're not building those strong stems and leaves, and you'll see them start to flop. So if that's happening, you need to stop the fertilizer. Let's hone in on one of the most striking andropogons, and it's Red October. Red October can reach a height of six to seven feet, and the color is really off the charts. It's absolutely red. In fact, you'll have red hues even in the beginning of spring, and then it will just turn a deeper, richer red in the fall. Now, Andropogon Red October is hardy to zone three. It can take a few years to get it to establish, but it's amazing. So imagine you're growing Red October Andropogon, and you walk out in the spring, and you're going to cut back all of that tan growth from last year so that this, the new shoots can have a start and get going, and you don't have this messy look of old shoots and new shoots. But the minute you start to see the shoots start to emerge, you're going to go out there, you're going to take off all of that old plant matter from the previous year, and you'll see these shoots emerge from the ground. And I kid you not, it looks like Christmas. It's a mix of red and green, and it's quite striking. And the color display does not stop there. It just continues. This thing just gets richer and richer, more and more red. And by the fall, it can look like it's on fire. I mean, that's how red this thing gets in the sun. It really is a wonderful ornamental grass. Now, a few other fun facts to know about this prairie plant. Chippewa Indians used to use the root of big blue stem as a diuretic and to alleviate stomach pains. They would take the leaf blades and they would extract the plant juices and use it as a wash for fevers or like Tylenol. The tallest specimen of Andropogon is the Girardi, which is named after John Girard, the botanist. He had a very interesting life, and he even named the yucca plant. Andropogon looks amazing against the skyline, against the prairie sky, because you'll see the plumes come up, and the blooms look like turkey feet. So you've got a bloom that comes up and then it splits into a fork. So you've got three individual feet and it looks like a turkey foot. So that's why this particular andropogon, the Girardi, is sometimes called turkey foot. Now they used the andropogon Girardi in the high line, in the plantings in the high line in New York. 
In fact, they reported that some of the clumps had reached eight feet tall this year. So if you're going to use the Girardi in your garden, make sure to leave a little bit of room and bear in mind that they will easily shade out anything else that's growing around it. Now, the foliage of the turkey foot starts out with this blue green and then turns into that amazing red bronze, just like the red October, not quite as red, but it has that ability to change color so dramatically throughout the season. It's tough. This was a prairie plant and it self seeds easily. So if you're going to put this in your garden, you're going to have to watch that self seeding. And I tell you what, you want to see a beautiful, natural combination of plants? Try Queen Anne's Lace with Andropogon Girardi. Amazing. Another warm season grass is Boudela gracilis, or prairie grass. It's also called mosquito grass because in the summer, you've got these eyelash-shaped flowers that are on the stems and they hover over the grass kind of like a cloud of insects. So this blue gramma grass, also known as Boudela gracilis, is a great choice for smaller areas because it only reaches about two to three feet in height. And the variety Blonde Ambition is the one you want to look for. This is such an unusual plant, but it's absolutely mesmerizing. Now the name Boudela honors two Spanish botanists who were brothers, Claudio Budalas and Esteban Budalas. And if you plant the variety Blonde Ambition, you will not be disappointed because you will have so many exquisite blooms on one plant, you're going to be bowled over. So the color on this Blonde Ambition starts out green, and then, of course, as fall comes in, it turns absolutely golden. And the whole thing is just this mass of yellow, thus the name Blonde Ambition. Now, it's hardy in zones four through nine. It's pretty ubiquitous. You can find it in nurseries all over the place. And it was a hot ticket back in 2015. Two years ago, people were going crazy for this blonde ambition, blue grandma grass. Some people think it looks like a candle blowing in the wind. It reminds me of Mexican feather grass, a shorter variety of it, but it's not as invasive. Another wonderful warm season grass are the Hakoni cloas or the conies, if you want to refer to them as that. But the Hakoni cloas is a species of grass that's native to Mount Hakoni on the island of Honshu in Japan. So it's obviously named from that particular location. And then cloa is from the Greek word chloe, meaning young green shoot or grass. So if you can imagine a grass with tufts that is thicker and has this beautiful yellow limey color to it, that's what I think of when I think of a Hakoni cloa. There are a number of striking golden varieties of conies. There's the all gold, the vestal, the aurora. They're gorgeous. The macra is a little bigger version than some of the others that I've seen. It looks beautiful paired with purple flowers like Purple Palace Hookra or Sambucus Black Lace. It even makes sumac stand out when it's planted as an underplanting below sumac. I saw a Twitter post earlier this week that said, Hakoni Kloa beats Q like rock beats scissors. So, of course, Q is the botanic garden in England that's so well known. And that just goes to show how fantastic Hakoni Kloa is and how fanatical fans of Hakoni Kloas can be. So, and if I didn't say it earlier, I'll say it again. Hakoni Kloas are grown in zones five through nine. Now here's a warm season grass I love to talk about, and it's Japanese bloodgrass with the Latin name Imperata cylindrica. 
Now, this grass with that Imperata name is named after an Italian naturalist and pharmacist named Ferrante Imperato. And he was a little bit like Carl Forrester in that he had a motto, and his motto was Latin, and it said, I'm going to butcher this, but it said, in dies octior, and it means I will improve day by day. So this is a gentleman that's striving to get better every single day. And a little known fact about Ferrante Imperato is that he was fascinated with asbestos, which was a relatively new substance during his day. And he was a very interesting person. So not only is he striving to get better every day, but he is amazingly curious. And he had this case where he would put all the little treasures that he had found in the natural world, and he would kind of catalog what he was discovering in his works. So he was experimenting with asbestos. And he drew all of these illustrations about his experiments with it. And just to show you how exceptionally curious this gentleman was, he wanted to argue that a toad's skull was actually stone, unlike any other natural stone. So he captured this pregnant viper and he gathered up these toads to prove that the viper could not penetrate the toad's skull. And so he called a toad's skull the toadstone. Not kidding. Anyway, this is the gentleman that Japanese bloodgrass is named for with the name Imperata cylindrica. And if you've ever seen Japanese bloodgrass, it's absolutely bright red. It's got a purple tone to it. So unlike that Andropogon Red October, that's more of a deeper rust red, this one's more purpley. And as with the Hakone Kloa, Japanese bloodgrass is grown in zones five through nine. And when you see Japanese bloodgrass growing, you'll notice that the bottom of it stays this very kind of chartreuse kind of green, and then the tips dramatically turn red. The variety Red Baron is an absolute standout. There's also Rubra, which turns a deep garnet. Now, Japanese bloodgrass is very long-lived. It's frost-hardy but it's one of those running rhizome grasses. Now, if you're growing Japanese bloodgrass, you're really growing it for the foliage because the blooms, there's really not much to speak of there. It does not have showy blooms. They're just these tiny silver flowers that you can see at the top of the stems. And of course, since it's a running rhizome, if you want to propagate it, all you have to do is separate off some of the rhizomes. All right, we've finally arrived at the M's. We're talking about Miscanthus, the etymological root of the binomial name Miscanthus, is derived from the Greek miskos, meaning stem, and anthos, meaning flower. So this is referring to the stalked spikelets. So there are a number of wonderful grasses in the genus Miscanthus. And of course, whenever you think of Miscanthus, you usually think of a huge mass, a huge cluster of grass. Now, Miscanthus is not a native to the United States or North America. Miscanthus is native to Asia. And if you're afraid of adding miscanthus to your garden because you're worried about how big it can get, try it in a container. They make fantastic container plants. And if you're worried about reseeding, then choose a late blooming cultivar. So if you have a late blooming miscanthus, the shorter growing season and the cold climate will reduce or eliminate all of that extra seed germination. Now, in Japan, they refer to miscanthus as Suzuki grass. And while here in the United States, we think of the leaves turning as a sure sign of fall, in Japan, they see the blooms of the Suzuki grass as an imminent sign of fall. 
Now, the University of Minnesota has an ethnobotany page, which shows all of the uses for miscanthus in the Orient. They use it for all kinds of everyday things, including textiles. They make kimonos with it and stationery. They use it for books and magazines. They've used the stems of miscanthus to thatch roofs. They use the flowers in the fall as a cut flower, and they celebrate the harvest moon. And of course, the flowers have come to represent a good harvest. Children in Asia use the forms of the flowers, and they turn them into owls or dolls with tiny brooms. They've even used miscanthus stems for chopsticks. Now, there are a number of cultivars of miscanthus. Some are tall, some can be up to 12 feet tall, some of them are dwarf varieties, they can be 3 to 4 feet tall. Let's go through some of the standout cultivars that I've picked for you today. Okay, let's start with the Yakujima. The Yakujima is a compact two to three foot tall miscanthus. So it's one of the smaller ones and it produces the signature silvery beige showy flowers that are about a foot to two foot above the foliage. In fact, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Yakujima is that it holds the bloom tight in the foliage. So this is not blooming on super tall stalks. The blooms are coming up from the foliage. They're kind of erupting out of the foliage. And then they stay pretty close to the top of the foliage. Now, there's another name for Yakujima miscanthus, dwarf maiden grass, and it looks absolutely fabulous in the fall. One of the things I like to see with this dwarf maiden grass in the fall is that the base of it, the, the leaves at the base of this miscanthus stay green, and then you've got these plumes that turn tan with the silvery, feathery foliage over the top. It's a wonderful contrast. So now take the miscanthus and contrast that with the purpurescence. And instead of having seed heads that are held tight in the foliage, you've got seed heads that are towering over the foliage on tall stalks. In fact, this particular miscanthus, the purpurescence, is a head turner in the fall because the foliage changes color. You end up with foliage that's red and green and orange. It's all these different colors blended together. And then you have the gorgeous signature silver blooms that are towering over all of that wonderful foliage in the fall. It's a showstopper. There's Miscanthus graziella, which is commonly referred to as maiden grass. The colors of this grass in the fall are absolutely glorious. They go from green to red and yellow, so lots of yellow tones with the graziella. Now, this particular one can be invasive. In fact, lots of states consider this an invasive plant. So you'll want to check in your area if this is something you should plant. I know in particular in the South, miscanthus is something that they're very cautious of adding to gardens. But again, consider trying it in a container if it's something you're worried about putting in the ground in your garden. Now, there's a lovely miscanthus called cabaret that is a perennial ornamental grass that has broad green and white striped blades. So to me, it kind of looks like a spider plant, except it's a spider plant on steroids. It's this miscanthus cabaret. In fact, it can reach six feet tall and four feet wide. Now, this is one where if you don't use it correctly in the garden because it's got so much going on with that white and green stripe, it can look like a hot mess, a disaster. So be very thoughtful before you incorporate something like Miscanthus Cabaret. Now, along the same lines, there is a miscanthus called gold bar that's got this zebra striping. So it's a bright green, and then it's got muted, creamy tones and stripes going across the leaves. This is a smaller miscanthus. It can look very jazzy with those stripes. 
It grows three to five feet tall and two to three feet wide. And then, of course, it has those white flowers later in the summer. And this is another one where there's a lot going on with this plant. And so you want to be very careful about where you put it in your garden. There's another nice dwarf variety of miscanthus that's called adagio. And with this particular miscanthus, when they say dwarf, this thing can grow up to five feet tall if you include the plumes. So the grass itself is probably more like three feet tall. But by the time the plumes are in full bloom, you've got a five foot tall plant. It can be three feet tall wide. And this grows in zones six to nine. The best part about adagio is the number of blooms that you get. It's a prolific bloomer, creamy plumes, and they persist all winter long. Now, there is a very pretty, very reliable miscanthus called Morning Light, and it is very, very beautiful in the fall. It doesn't hold up as well in the winter as some of the other grasses. It kind of flops over, but the blooms are gorgeous. You can use it as a hedge. It tends to be a little more floppier, and Garden Glitz last year showed it being used as a hedge, and they alternated it with hydrangea paniculata. So you have the hydrangea, and then you have this big, moppy, floppy, morning light miscanthus, and then another paniculata, and then another moppy, floppy, ginormous morning light miscanthus. It was a very striking arrangement in the garden. Another way I've seen it used to great effect is to plant one single morning light miscanthus and have it act as a faux fountain because that's how the blades of grass come up and kind of shoot out. It has a very fountain-like appearance. So imagine it surrounded by boxwood and then you have this morning light miscanthus fountain growing right out of the middle of that. One of the very best aspects of morning light miscanthus is the fact that it's one of the finer leafed miscanthuses. It's very delicate looking. And if I forgot to mention it, this particular miscanthus grows in zones five through nine. Okay, two miscanthuses left to go. This next one is a little butterball. It's Miscanthus transmorosinensis, and it's three to four feet high and three to four feet wide, and it gets positively red-brown in the wintertime. It's got these fabulously muted colors for a fall-winter backdrop. Lots of great winter interest with this one. Okay, then the last one is Miscanthus Rote Silver, which literally translated means red silver. The name really says everything about this particular Miscanthus. It's quite tall. It grows four to five feet tall, and then the plumes extend past that, and you get these symmetrical clumps of deep green blades and then these prominent purple plumes. It's very majestic looking. This one is hardy through zone five. All right, all right. It's time to talk about muley grasses, the genus of Muhlenbergia. This is often most people's favorite ornamental grass. If they have to pick one, if they're familiar with ornamental grasses, you'll almost always hear people say that this is their absolute favorite. Let's learn a little bit about the Muhlenbergia genus. These are plants that make their home in the southern United States and Mexico. They often grow in very dry, arid, or semi-arid regions, and they're great for xeriscapes, or low-maintenance or low-water gardens. Now, the Muhlenbergias were named after a scientist who was also a Lutheran minister and self-taught botanist, and his name was Gotthilf Henry Ernest Muhlenberg, so he had two middle names. And he was born in 1753 and lived until 1815. 
Interestingly enough, he was born in Pennsylvania. He went back to Germany with his parents, and then he returned to Pennsylvania. So he finally settled here. And he has a very fascinating story. Among other things, he became interested in botany when he was hiding from British soldiers during the Revolutionary War. And here's something else that's kind of fascinating about him. He joined the American Philosophical Society, which was the first scientific association in the New World, and it was founded by Benjamin Franklin, John Bartram, and many others. So he had a lot of very interesting associations with early Americans. And of course, because he was a son of Pennsylvania, Many of his herbaria are now at Drexel University in Pennsylvania. A few other things that Muhlenberg was able to discover and accomplish, he discovered and identified the bog turtle in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. In fact, the turtle is named Muhlenbergi in his honor. Another little-known fact about Muhlenberg's legacy is that his grandson was the namesake for Muhlenberg College, which is a private liberal arts college in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And Muhlenberg's father was also a pastor, and he became the German patriarch of the Lutheran Church in America. Now, when you look at the genus Muhlenbergia, It's easy to see why muley grasses are some of the most revered and adored ornamental grasses. They are dramatic. They are gorgeous with their pink plumes. In fact, that pink muley can absolutely positively stop traffic when it's blooming. There's a variety called white cloud that looks like moonlight shining on white plumes. That one's a showstopper as well. Monrovia makes a pink variety that's called Regal Mist. And when you plant these things in mass, they look positively like cotton candy has descended over your garden. It's absolutely delicious. It really does look otherworldly. Well, I could go on and on talking about muley grass, but the majority of you are probably already doing that. So let's talk about some of these others, and then we'll finish up. First is panicum. Now, panicum just might be my favorite genus. This is another prairie grass native to North America. They're tough, they're functional, and the name panicum is where we get the term panic grass. We refer to these grasses as panic grasses in the genus panicum. They're grown for grain and fodder. And if you think of that word panicum, pan is the word for bread, and it's also referring to millets. And so that is kind of a nod to the use for panicum grasses. In fact, panicum has been used in recent decades to make ethanol. There's a lot of energy in panicum. Now, Panicum North Wind took the spotlight in 2014 as plant of the year. In fact, listener Beth Engel wrote, this is hands down my favorite grass. And what's great about North Wind is that it's so stately. It remains completely upright all year long. It gets to be about five to six feet tall within three years after you plant it from just a tiny little plug. And it's got this gorgeous fall color. I mean to tell you, it's positively yellow golden. It's just gorgeous in the fall. And then because of the way that it stands so straight, so upright, it always reminds me of the mast on a ship. There's just something about it. Then there's Panicum Heavy Metal that has a beautiful metallic blue hue. I've seen it used with salvia. It looks gorgeous. Nice combination. Then there's panicum rote straw bush, which, of course, you have the word rote in there. You know instantly that there's going to be some red in this particular panicum. This one survives winters as far north as zone three. 
So with this one, you get these beautiful pink blooms that come out in July. So we're just about to see those guys. And then it has this gorgeous autumn color. It's absolutely this beautiful burgundy red color. And it starts to come out in July. And it just gets deeper as the season progresses. Now, what I love about Rotstrahl is that it also has a more upright form. It's one of the smallest of the panicums. And another popular variety is Panicum Shenandoah. Oh, and I nearly forgot to mention that panicums are often referred to as switchgrass. Now, the Shenandoah switchgrass, or panicum, has many strong colors. It starts out with this green, and then it turns to red, burgundy, and bronze, and they grow more vivid throughout the season. Shenandoah is a nice, compact plant. You can grow it in zones 4 through 9, and I once saw a garden that had planted Shenandoah panicum in a grid format, and it was breathtaking. Another variety of panicum that's a standout is Dallas Blues. This one stands out because of the blue three-quarter inch wide leaves that it has, and then it's got this billowy pink colored seed head. So that makes for a tremendous combination. And then I thought I'd end our chat on panicums with this quote by Roy Diblick of Northwind Perennial Farm. Roy, as luck would have it, introduced the Northwind panicum in the early 1990s. It came from a seed that he had collected in 1982 near railroad tracks off of a highway in Illinois. And as the seedlings grew, he noticed that there was one that had an unusual, beautiful blue-green leaf that was growing rather upright. And I loved this quote that Roy said about finding this particular panicum. He said, I think the habit of this plant with its distinct upright growth habit, its durable lifestyle and appreciated architectural essence has helped it find a welcomed place in many gardens. This is one of uncountable naturally occurring hybrids that occur with all native plants. We just need to keep our eyes open. Now it's time to talk about penicetums. Penicetums are known as the fountain grasses or the feather grasses. Now, in terms of the etymology of the word penicetum, in Latin, the word pen means feather. So that's probably where we get the whole term feather pen, that we were going to pen a letter or write a letter. So penicetum literally translates into feather grass. So when we're talking about the penicetums, we often think of fountain grass or feather grass. Now, why are they called fountain grass? Because most penicetums grow in flowing fountain-like shapes. These are the ones that produce these lovely bottle brush plumes. So when you think of in the olden days how they used to write those letters with those big plumed feathers, that's what I always associate with the penicetums. Penicetums are not native to the United States. They're actually native to Africa, Asia, and other tropical or subtropical places around the world. They like hot sun and humidity, and they really don't require too much maintenance. Let's go through a few of the most popular specimens. The first is Hamel. Now, this penicetum is also referred to as dwarf fountain grass. This one reaches up to three feet tall and two feet wide, so it's definitely a dwarf, and it's zone four through 11, so this can be planted in so many different gardens. Now, this is such a happy little grass. It forms a clump of bright green arching leaves, and then you have these poofs of silvery flowers. Sometimes they have this very slight pinkish tinge, but they're very, very happy. This variety is light and airy, and of course, like all penicetums, it thrives with very little care. Then there's one of my absolute favorites, and it's the penicetum known as Desert Plains. This one is 
tremendous. You get great summer and fall foliage with huge plumes, these beautiful tan flowers. I'm telling you, you could not announce fall in a better way than with a desert plains penicetum. It's a stunner. Such a prolific bloomer. And then these huge bottle brush feathers at the top. Amazing. Now there's an adorable smaller variety that you can grow that's called red bunny tails. Now I grew this one from seed and now I'm completely overrun with them. Now this one is another happy little one to grow and the little seed heads look like tiny little bunny tails. They're very soft. They're wonderful texture in the garden. Now, when it comes to bunny tails, you can choose to grow red bunny tails or white bunny tails. Anyway, they're a wonderful addition to the garden. So textural. There's a penicetum called Red Riding Hood that I'm partial to. What I like about it is that the, the feathers are predominantly blonde. They're very lightly colored. And then they just have this tiny shadowing of red that goes over the blonde. It's like a, a very subtle highlight, almost like a little ombre in that feather, that wonderful seed head. And that's how it came by the name Red Riding Hood. And then finally, there's Rubrum. And rubrum is a stunner because you have this purple burgundy foliage and then these amazing flower spikes that grow to be about three feet tall and wide. This one is hardy in zones nine through 10. This is the purple fountain grass. It's stunning. All right, now it's time to talk about the schizocerium's. So there's a schizocerium that's very popular. It's called little blue stem. But let's talk a little bit about the etymology of the word schizocerium. So the schiz part indicates that there is a split. That's Latin for splitting. And then you have the acron part of the word that refers to chaff. And the chaff part of this is where you have this spikelet part of the grass. So schizocerium is referring to the fact that you have these two chaff-like bracts that are enclosing the grass floret. So it's the flower that's really driving the name for this type of grass. Now, I love the schizocerium grasses. The blue stem grass is beautiful. It's a very peaceful looking grass, and it holds up all season long, including the winter. And don't forget that when we started out by talking about prairie plants, schizocerium were in that classification. So these are prairie plants of North America. This guy is super hardy. He can grow even in zone three. So they can be incorporated into gardens across America. I know the Mount Cuba Center shared a gorgeous shot of their meadow of schizocerium, a solid meadow of the little blue stem, and it looked absolutely glorious in the fall. And remember when I talked about the high line? Well, they also grow little blue stem, schizocerium, the standing ovation variety. That's the cultivar that they grow because it was bred to stay upright just a little bit longer. So this particular little blue stem is an incredibly blue colored grass. So it's like a blue, green, purple, sometimes even red. It's got a very manageable height, one to two feet thus the name Little Blue Stem, and it's found in all 50 states in a variety of conditions, so it's fantastic for a number of gardens. In the winter, it gets this tawny color. It just totally stands out against the snow and the elements on a winter day. Now, another blue grass that's absolutely gorgeous is Sorgastrum Sioux Blue. Now, the sorgastrum grasses are known as Indian grasses. And in my opinion, they're one of the most beautiful native grasses of North America. If the wind even hints of blowing by Indian grass, by sorgastrum, 
you are going to see a ton of movement and you are going to hear that fabulous rustling sound that grass makes. In fact, we can tell a lot about this particular grass from the name, from the origin of the name for this particular grass. So you have the word sorgastrum, which is of Greek origin, and it's referring to sorghum, which is a cereal grass. So the word sorgastrum means imitation of sorghum. So the European settlers are comparing this Indian grass to sorghum, the cereal grass. And then the species name, Newton's, comes from the Latin for the word swain. So the swain of this sorgastrum is how the Indian grass received its botanical name. Now, this grass is fantastic in mass plantings. People use it for prairie restoration and erosion control. It is hailed as one of the very best native grasses that you can put in an ornamental garden. This one is also being used in the High Line. And one of the reasons they picked it is that it's an extremely tough grass. It's great in difficult spots. You've got yellow flowers, and those flowers contrast so nicely with the blue foliage. I mean, who wouldn't like that yellow-blue combination? And again, look to plant this particular grass in mass. So once again, the variety that I particularly care for is the Sioux Blue Indian Grass. And Sioux is like Sioux Indian. So it's S-I-O-U-X. And growing up in Worthington near Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I definitely grew up knowing how to spell the word Sioux. By the way, this particular grass, that Sioux Blue Indian grass, looks fantastic with rudbeckia and sedum. You get this classic look for summer as you head into fall. Mature height on that Sioux Blue is six feet tall, and it gets about two to three feet wide. So Sorgastrum Newton's Sioux Blue is an absolute rock star for your garden. Okay, so that wraps up my conversation around the different specimens that you can look to incorporate in your garden. And of course, in your area, there are going to be even more specimens, more varieties to choose from. So do your homework. You know the difference between warm season and cool season and deciduous and evergreen and annual and perennial, of course. And now let's talk just a little bit about care and maintenance. Now, because grasses are are so low maintenance, there's not a ton of material to cover here. But I want to make sure that I go over some of the essentials so that you're better equipped to incorporate them into your garden. First, let's talk about planting. When you're planting your grasses, you want to make sure to wear gloves because some of these grasses can be a little sharp and you don't want to cut yourself or hurt your hands. So one of the first times I worked with a miscanthus that I had planted, I realized very quickly that I didn't work with that particular plant without wearing gloves. And you'll figure it out as you go as well, but start out wearing gloves because then you won't hurt yourself. Now, you want to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that you plant grasses in areas where they're going to have good drainage. And a way that you can give them a little leg up is to make sure that you're planting them on a mound. So don't bury them deeply. Keep those crowns high above the soil line. Now, when you're planting them, if you want to, you can add a time-release fertilizer, something gentle, and that will be the only time you should ever fertilize them. Because remember, once you add fertilizer or if you continue to fertilize your grasses, you're going to see that that extra nitrogen is going to make them flop over, and that's a look you're not going to want. So don't fertilize them after you do your initial planting. However, in the spring, you can definitely add compost around your grasses. That's completely fine. Now, as far as when to plant, 
The shoulder seasons are generally the best for grasses. If you have warm season grasses, definitely plant them in the spring so that they can get established. If you plant them in the fall, they may not have time to get going. Remember, they have to take that entire growing season to get established. And it can take a couple of years to have those warm season grasses really perform the way you want them to. But Overall, grasses are tough, especially those grasses that we talked about that are native to North America. They were prairie grasses. They had to be tough. They're resilient and they're forgiving. But water is still very important, especially in that first year if you want to get them established. Now, if you want to plant them in mass, definitely plant them close together. So a good rule of thumb is to take the height of the plant, the mature height of the plant, and then divide that in half. So if you have a plant that's going to be six feet tall, plant them with a gap of about three feet from one plant to another. And then that will be a nice close proximity for your mass planting. If you want them to appear more distinct and separate, then take their height and have that be the distance in between the two plants. So if you have a a grass that's gonna get six feet tall, then make sure that the distance between that first grass and the second grass is about six feet apart. Now, remember, you have those two types of growth habits going on. You have the clumpers and you have those rhizome runners. But you have to remember that even if you're concerned about the running rhizomes, that the majority of them are really more like walkers or crawlers. They don't become crazily invasive unless they're in perfect circumstances. Most of them are kind of walkers or crawlers when it comes to spreading, even if they're rhizomatic. Now, I say that bearing in mind that certain species may be terribly invasive in your area. So before you plant any grass, talk to your garden center specialist, do a little bit of online homework so you know what you're getting into. Please don't plant an invasive grass in your garden. There are so many wonderful grasses that can be a true positive addition. There's no need to go through that. So do your homework, talk to other gardeners in your area before you just plant a grass willy-nilly. Now let's chat about cutting them down. For your warm season deciduous grasses, these are the ones that turn tan in the fall and you end up with these gorgeous plumes, these beautiful seed heads that we want to leave up for not only winter interest, but also for the birds. We're going to wait until spring comes and we step outside and we begin to see that beautiful green growth emerging from the ground around all of that tan material. And what we're going to do is about three to five feet inches up from the base of the plant, we're going to cut off all of that old material. And when we do that, this allows the sun to actually penetrate and reach that crown. And of course, these warm season grasses love the sun. These are grasses that want the heat. They want to feel that sun and they need about six hours or more of sun every single day. If you have a variegated variety that you're growing, a variegated grass, they can take a little less sun. But the majority of these warm season grasses are looking for that sunshine. So you're going to want to cut that old growth down from the previous year. And one of the quick ways to do that is using a serrated knife. And if you don't have a serrated knife, like a bread knife or a watermelon knife, you can go ahead and use a, an electric or a gas saw. Just be careful if you're going to take those measures. Now, if you have an evergreen or cool season grass, these are the grasses that stay blue, they stay green, they they stay brown all season long. All you need to do with these cool season plants is just give them a haircut. So I think about it this way. You gather up the grass almost like you're going to make a ponytail and you pull your hands up to the very, very top and you're going to clean out all of the dead dying pieces of grass, the blades of grass 
that are not living anymore. So they're dried up, they're in there, you kind of kind of got to rustle it around like you would if you were giving your kids a haircut. However, you do not want to give these grasses a crew cut, you do not want to shave them off to the ground, or shave them at quite severely the way that you do those warm season grasses. What you want to do here is take the grasses in your hand and gather them all up and then just maybe chop off the first inch or two. Just give them a light little haircut, just a trim. And we mean just a trim. Don't be like one of those hairstylists that goes bananas here. You don't want to do that with your cool season grasses. Now, my little tip for pruning my grasses, especially if I have a larger grass that's tough for me to hang on to, is I will either take duct tape and wrap around the grass to keep it under control as I'm cutting, or I'll use a bungee rope and I'll wrap that around the grass before I start to prune. And then I either shear it off with a hedge trimmers or that serrated knife that I talked about earlier. Okay, we've made it to division and propagating. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Your grasses will sometimes donut. And by donut, I mean that they die out in the middle. The middle of it just kind of doesn't come back. It starts to die back. So when you go out in the spring and you check on your grass and you start to see that donut, especially after about the three to five year mark, you might begin to see that, then you'll know that it's time to divide them. And I tend to like to divide my grasses in the spring. And here's what I do. I dig around only half the plant. This is the same way that I divide things like my hostas or my hookahs or my iris. I will only dig around half of the plant and I'll leave the other half completely undisturbed. So if you can think about your plant as a moon, we're going to dig a half moon from about 12 o'clock to six o'clock. Now, Despite what you might think, the roots of grasses aren't terribly deep, but they are tremendously fibrous. They're tremendously dense. And so this is where your serrated knife, your bread knives, your watermelon knives, these really heavy duty knives that you probably don't use as much in the kitchen, but you use regularly in the garden come in handy. And Nothing is truer than for when you're working with something like grasses or like hostas and you've got those dense fibrous roots. So after I've dug around that plant in that half moon fashion, then I have to cut the pizza in half. I have to go from 12 o'clock to six o'clock and I have to cut it in half. Now, one of the easiest ways to do that is to take a sawzall. And here I actually take a reciprocating saw and I make sure that I have the longest blade that I can possibly get on this reciprocating saw. And I just zzz, right down the middle, I just saw right down the middle, I'm slicing that pizza in half. And then you just lift it out with your shovel. It's the easiest way to divide your ornamental grass. Now, one last thing to think about when we're talking about division and propagating is that some of your grasses are going to seed themselves. Now, if that happens, you can totally let those baby plants grow and then replace the mother plant. If she's died out or she's starting to die out, that's another option for maintaining the health of your grasses. Well, that's it for today's show, all about ornamental grasses. I hope you enjoyed learning about all of the different varieties. In fact, I hope this episode made you excited to incorporate grasses into your landscape. Remember, grasses are fantastic companion plants, and they make many, many flowers stand out even more in your garden. Flowers like rutabecchia, coneflower, joe pieweed, queen of the prairie, rogersia, roses, sedum, iris, and ornamental lilies, just to name a few. 
And don't forget to check out the Facebook group for this podcast. It's totally free and you can easily join just by typing the Still Growing Podcast group into the search bar the next time you're on Facebook. And then you can get all of the posts and the links that are mentioned on the show today, along with the bonus content that I share right in your Facebook feed. So don't be shy. Go ahead. Join the listener community on Facebook, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I look forward to meeting you in the group. Well, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, my fabulous editor, Eric Begay, my copywriter, Ein Kadena, and my project manager, David Gregerson. And I'd like to thank the listeners that make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi, and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens. She's a fabulous contributor in the group, and she gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann was featured in episode 553, and she's the brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants. That episode 553 was fun. She shared her entire presentation on incorporating more natives into your landscape, which is something I hope you're doing in your 2017 garden. Just a reminder, I'll have all the generous information that was shared on the show today about ornamental grasses on the Still Growing Podcast page over on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A dot com. And if you want to send me an email, you can reach me at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Well, I hope that old phrase that I just made up sticks in your head all week long, Wise gardeners make passes at ornamental grasses. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.